In the previous week, we looked into the concept of energy and the energy use of some major sectors. But now it should be clear that the global energy consumption is a very large. So the big question is, do we have enough renewable energy generation sources available to meet our enormous energy demands? This week, we will look at some of the most important renewable energy technologies. The physical principle behind the conversion mechanisms of each technology will be explained, followed by a rough estimations of the primary energy potential, systems efficiencies, and finally, energy yield. Each lecture will end with the advantages and disadvantages and important figures of the technology. Week 2 will give you some first insight into the opportunities and limitations of the various renewable energy technologies. Be aware that we only make rough estimations this week. Later during this course, we will look in more detail into the technological and system aspects of the various renewable energy technologies. Before we move on to this week's topic, let's go through the concepts of primary energy potential, systems efficiency, and energy yield. The primary energy potential is known as the available energy from the primary source. We may also express this as the power potential if you take the available energy per unit time. The primary energy has to be converted into useful energy. We will look into the fundamental conversion efficiency losses for each of the renewable energy systems. The output power of a system is equal to the product of the primary potential and its system's efficiency. Depending on the technology, the maximum output power might be called the installed nominal or rated capacity of a system. Throughout the year, the power output of a system changes. This could be caused by various reasons and it influences the yearly energy yield. How much the actual yield deviates from the nominal output is represented by the capacity factor, which is equal to the energy yield divided by the nominal output multiplied by the time interval. The capacity factor represents the practical losses of a renewable energy system. These concepts may seem vague now, but I'm sure they will become very clear once we apply them to the technologies discussed in this week. Let's now focus on hydropower. There are many large hydropower plants around the world. An example is the Itaipu Dam in Brazil, which is shown here. A hydroelectricity dam is a system that converts the potential energy of water at a high difference into electricity. Hydropower plants are usually built next to a natural lake or water reservoir that collects the water incident on a large area. Let's look in more de detail to the hydropower generation. We will start with the sun. Sunlight evaporates seawater resulting in the formation of clouds. The water vapor in clouds precipitates as rain or snow that is then collected in a large reservoir through streams and rivers. Due to this precipitation, the reservoir fills up to a certain height. This water contains potential energy. Once the water drops down, the energy is converted to mechanical energy by a rotating turbine. The turbine is connected to a huge electric generator to convert the mechanical energy into electrical energy. The generator is connected via transformers to the electricity grid to deliver electricity. Let's take a look at the factors that determine the primary energy potential efficiencies and the energy yield. Hydropower uses the potential energy in the reservoir's water. Potential energy is the energy that is released by dropping a certain mass from a certain height. This is shown in the following equation where E pot is the potential energy in joule, M is the mass of the water, G is the gravitational constant of 9.8 uh, meters per square second, and H is the height difference between the source and the outflow of the dam. We can also express this as the potential power if instead of mass, the mass flow is used. 
The mass is strongly related to the amount of rainfall and total area from which the reservoir collects the water. This is referred to as the catchment area, here enclosed by the red line. If you know the size of this area, we can estimate the total energy potential of a certain region or dam. The water mass, M water, is related to the precipitation according to this equation, where the precipitation is, a, is the amount of rainfall in cubic meters per square meter, rho is the density in kilograms per cubic meter, and A is the catchment area in square meters. There are some factors that reduce the conversion efficiency of a hydro plant. The losses in the hydropower system are mainly caused by three factors. When the water flows from the inlet to the outlet, the potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. The water flow loses some of its kinetic energy too, due to friction at the edges of the pipe. The second loss mechanism occurs when the turbine converts kinetic energy of the water to rotational or mechanical energy. Finally, some losses occur in the generator and transformer where mechanical energy is converted to electric energy and when the electric energy is converted to a higher voltage. The final energy yield of a hydropower plant can be strongly influenced by the weather conditions, especially the amount of precipitation. This affects the available water flow and the high difference of the water and consequently the potential energy. This explains why seasonal fluctuations in the power output occur. Another factor is that the power plant, like many systems, has a certain downtime for maintenance and repair. Next, let's work through an example. Let's say a certain region has about 500 mm of rain per year and there is no melt weather from mountain snow or glaciers. Additionally, the height difference between the source and the outflow of the dam is 100 meters. With this information, we can calculate the energy potential in joules. First, we will determine the total mass of water. 500 mm of rain per year is equal to 0.5 cubic meters of water per square meter. By multiplying that with the density of water, we get that per square meter of land there is 500 kilograms of water per year. Use a height of 100 meters, we will receive 490 kilojoules of potential energy per square meter per year. This equals to 136 watt hours per square meter. If we divide by the total hours a year, we obtain, we obtain a power density of 0.016 watts per square meter. Note that this calculation is purely the potential energy. This does not take into account the efficiencies of the system. To learn more about the total energy yield, we will take a closer look to our example in the introduction, the Itaipu Dam on the border of Brazil and Paraguay. The Itaipu Dam is the second largest hydropower plant on the planet. It has a total installed generation capacity of 14 gigawatt and in 2015 has reached a yield of 89.5 terawatt hours per year. Using these values, we can calculate the capacity factor. If we divide 89.5 terawatt hours by 14 gigawatt times the total hours in a year, we will re receive a capacity factor of 0 0.73. So you could say, on average, the dam produces electricity at a maximum capacity during 73% of the time. Note this value is much higher than the average global capacity factor for hydropower of 0.40. So what exactly are the advantages and challenges of hydroelectricity? One way of looking at a reservoir is considering it as a storage of potential energy. At moments when the production surpasses the demand, the water in the reservoir can be pumped to a greater height. Then, when the demand is higher, the water can flow down again to produce electricity. Therefore, you can easily control the power output in a hydropower plant without losing valuable potential energy. A hydropower plant can therefore provide support to the grid and supply a stable power output. Another advantage is its long lifetime of 30 to 100 years. Therefore, despite being large concrete constructions, a hydropower plant can have a relatively low carbon footprint. However, hydropower doesn't work without a very large water reservoir. 
Such a reservoir has a huge impact on the local flora, fauna and landscape. In case of really large hydroelectricity projects, the local climate could even change due to the change in water cycle. As a result of the impact on the surroundings of the dam, the global potential of new hydropower is relatively limited. Nevertheless, it's still the biggest contributor to renewable energy electricity with a global installed capacity of 1211 gigawatt, producing approximately 3975 terawatt hours of electricity. If we take a population of 7.5 billion people on this planet, this results in an energy density of 1.45 kilowatt hour per person per day. It's predicted that in 2040, the global electricity demand will be equal to 4.2 terawatts. Note, this is not the total energy demand, only the electrical energy demand. With this map, we can visualize, visualize what surface area is required to cover this demand with the technology discussed in each video. Hydroelectricity has a surface power density of 0.1 to 0.2 watts per square meter. This includes the total catchment area, not just the reservoir area. Therefore, an area of 21 squared mega kilometers is required. In this video, we have gone through some important definitions we will use throughout this week. We then discussed hydroelectricity and did some rough calculations. The most important factors in producing hydroelectricity are the amount of water and the height difference. Hydropower can provide a constant source of energy and can even function as an energy storage source. The, the environmental impact of a hydro plant can be quite significant, however. In the next video, we will discuss another renewable energy source, wind energy.